Welcome, everyone. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you for joining us today. We have an exciting talk for you today on fine-grained authorization for your application, how you can use Amazon verified permissions. I'm excited to have me here today with Julian Lovelock, Abhishek Pandey, and Plamen Garkov uh, talk, joining me here today to take you on this journey. So you're gonna learn about what is Amazon verified permissions and why are we here? Why did we build it? What are the problems it can solve for you? And Julian is gonna take a peek into what have our customers told us? What have you told us from our preview on what are the use cases that it solves for you? And you're gonna hear about how Panasonic Avionics is using verified permissions for their use cases. I'm very excited to hear Plumman talk about it. And then we're gonna end on how easy it is to get started with Amazon verified permissions. So why did we build it? I wanna take tell a little story here. About 10 years ago, everybody was building their own authentication system. I don't know how many people remember that, but everybody thought, oh, this is easy. Oh, I, I need a database with usernames and passwords. That's it. And I can build an authentication system. But what ended up happening was it required secure hashing algorithms. It required salting. It required password reset. It required password recovery. It required email verification. This was all hard. It led to challenges with consistency. It led to challenges with scalability. It led, it was, it led with challenges due to security. And all of these reasons apply to authorization as well. Because most people want to say, how do I do authorization? This is what happens. Imagine you have a cool new idea. Your cool new idea is to build a personal digital library. It's multi-tenant and it's gonna be the next big thing. Why are permissions hard, right? Like this looks like an easy piece of code. What's hard about it? Start super easy. It's just an if statement. If you are the owner, of course, you get access. Okay, easy enough to start. What happens next? Oh, just one more if statement, that's it. Just one more if statement, because you want to also allow the admins to be able to access. Okay, I'll quit tomorrow, that's, that's fine. So far, so good. <laughs> Multi-factor authentication, because of course we are, we are Secure people, we want to add multi-factor authentication. We are up to three rules now. How are these rules related to each other? Does order matter? Does the nesting matter? What are actually the conditions that would lead to access allowed or denied? It's getting hard to figure it out. But we are not done yet because as we scale, there's new permissions that require that are needed for new features. There's one other interesting bit here. Notice the application logic is falling off the screen. And that's what you really care about, your application logic. So how does verified permissions help? All that messy permissions code, you can replace with a couple of lines of code. It's a call to verified permissions. And all the rules are now specified as policies. We had a rule that says if you are a resource owner, then you get access. If you are an admin, you get access. But you will want to forbid access if it's not multi-factor authenticated. It's clean. You can see what happens. You, we know that order doesn't matter in which policies are evaluated. We know that a forbid statement trumps a allow statement. And that semantics is just like how AWS IAM works. Speaking of IAMs, there's a lot of lessons that we have learned in IAM and we apply here. It's related to scalability. We have 10 years of running authorizations at scale. IAM is serving a billion requests a second today. And that's 
the part we want to provide for verified permissions, the consistency, the scalability, and security. But there are a few differences between IAM and verified permissions that I want to call out. In IAM, AWS enforces the decision. In IAM, AWS defines the nouns and the verbs. What are the resources? What are the actions? Who are the users? But in verified permissions, you enforce the decisions. In verified permissions, you define the nouns and the verbs. You define who are the, what, who are the users, what are the resources, which are the actions. And we have a big talk planned for you today. Julian is going to share all the things that we've learned in the last six months. As we launched this in preview, you and our other customers told us about where you found it useful. And then fasten your seat belts, literally, because we're going to go on a journey with Panasonic Avionics on how they use Amazon verified permissions. We'll have Julian and Abhi back on the show doing a live demo, so make sure you say a little prayer to the demo gods. And uh, finally, I'll talk about why it is easy to get started. So Julian, kick it off. Thanks, Neha. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm Julian Lovelock. I'm the product manager for Amazon Verified Permissions, and I'll be joined in a moment for the demo by my colleague, Abby, who is my co-product manager. So we launched a gated preview of Amazon Verified Permissions uh, back in November at reInvent. Just a quick show of hands, I'm just curious, do we have any gated preview customers in the audience tonight? Thank you very much, sir. Any others? Okay. Um, I wanna go through a few of the things that we learned from you, our customers, in regards to that. We, um, we had over 500 customers request for the access. We onboarded 90 customers. We talked to every one of those 90 customers. There's four things I want to talk to you about that we learned from you, our customers. The first, one size fits all. OK, that statement smells of a certain amount of hubris, um, maybe a wishful thinking. As you might imagine, across the spectrum of customers, those 90 customers, we saw a fairly wide variety of different applications, different use cases, different architectures. But what struck us through the process was actually the underlying CEDA policy language held up remarkably well in terms of being able to manage permissions and policies for all of those different types of use cases. And that gave us the confidence back at the beginning of May to open source CEDA. So you can go to GitHub, to the public repo, and download the CEDA SDK, which will enable you to evaluate policies and the specification for the CEDA policy language. A little call out, there are sessions through the day, and there's one at four o'clock, I think, which will go into more depth in CEDA. And Plumman will be showing some of the policies that they used at Panasonic Avionics for the CEDA policy language. I said I'd talk a little bit about the different classes of application, the different ways the product was used. So there are three I want to drill down on. The first is what we class internal service access. So this is where the application in question is being built by an organization in order to give access to employees of that organization the resources of that, of that organization. So some of the characteristics from a permissions management perspective of these classes of applications are that the users, or in Cedar speak, the principles, tend to be organized into fairly well-defined hierarchies, and that the permissions are often oriented around roles that relate to individuals' position in those hierarchies. We also see multiple application development teams within the organization building applications, often, underlying the, uh, often accessing the same underlying data resources. And so consistency of policies across multiple applications within an organization becomes quite a big driver from a CISO perspective. And talking of the CISO, zero trust is a big driver in this class of applications, in all applications, but especially in this class of applications. And so verified permissions, which enables you to define policies 
down to very tight levels of resource so you can define least privilege and also to verify those permissions continuously is a big plus. Some of the challenges that you see in this class of applications is what we might categorize as role explosion, where you see hundreds of different roles come forth in the organization. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that. The second class of application that we saw Verify's permissions used for is customer-facing applications. These are applications built by the organization to sell, service, market, support, their products out to their customers. So the users of these applications are the organization's customers rather than its workforce. In these cases, the users aren't organized into neat hierarchies. The, the permissions instead tend to be based on the relationship that that user has with the organization. Are you a prime customer? Are you a gold tier customer? Are you not a customer but somebody who's just not placed any orders at all, but you're a wannabe customer. These are the relationships that then drive the permissions. So it's different kind of model when you think about permissions management for these. As you might imagine, given that the users of these applications are the customers of the organization, that UX becomes super critical. Being able to deliver a good quality UX and a permissions management that is able to deliver that is a key requirement. Some of the particular challenges in this class of application are the fact that often you want the users to be able to define their own permissions within certain boundaries. So if it's an online banking application, then the user might want to be able to set up an authorized signatory on the account and give the requisite permissions to that authorized signatory. The third class of applications were software vendor, software as a service. This is where the software itself is the product. Quite often, these are workforce applications. They're HR applications, ERP systems, CRM, any kind of weird acronym, basically. They tend to be workforce-oriented. They're often multi-tenant, because you're not much of an organization if you only sell your customer software to one customer. And as a result of that multi-tenancy, you're often seeing multiple identity providers because each customer that you sell your software to, which is a tenant, may have its own identity profile with some unique characteristics of the users. And so when you think about attribute-based permissions that are based on the attributes of the user, if you're dealing with multiple identity providers, that introduces an element of complexity. One of the requirements that we saw come forth quite heavily from this class of application was actually custom roles. Organizations want to be able to set up their software so that each tenant can define their own role, their own roles. If you're building a CRM system, tenant one might define granularity of access to sales opportunities based on one set of criteria, or one, and so that's one role, and tenant two might have a whole different view. So customized roles and the ability of the underlying permission system to support that is a key requirement. And so that leads me rather nicely into introducing Plamen, who's going to talk about their experience at Panasonic Avionics using verified permissions. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everybody. My name is Plamen. I'm a software engineer with Panasonic Avionics. And I'm excited to share our use case with you uh, today. Um, <clears throat> so when we uh, when I try to find a way to explain uh, easily what Panasonic Avionics does and what is the context, the use case for us, I found this uh, photo that uh, shows a aircraft cabin with the monitors that are uh, that are installed on the seat backs. That's the uh, Panasonic Avionics manufactures, deploys, and services the networking and the actual hardware and software that is installed on the aircraft. And we also not only manufacture the hardware, but also we provide uh, content services, including management of all the movies that we see on the uh, aircraft uh, itself. So uh, you can, Im another way of looking at the uh, Panasonic Avionics business is to imagine that we have 
a thousands of aircrafts flying on a daily basis, and each aircraft has a hundreds of uh, seed bags that are installed on the aircraft, and there is a content server on the aircraft itself that is streaming movies on demand. Um, and what this leads me to is I want to give you a little bit of what that in a, in a, in a, uh, in a practical manner means. What that means is a one aircraft usually has a exploitation period around 30 years, and the retrofit period is on average 13 years. That means that um, the, you cannot update the hardware and the software rapidly. Uh, you can update the hardware uh, maybe every 13 years or so. So that uh, leads us to uh, make sure, and also all the software and the hardware needs to be certified and it needs to be uh, verified and checked. So that naturally leads us to develop software that is as configurable as possible in order to create the ability to introduce a flexibility into our solutions without having to redeploy our software on those thousands of aircrafts um, simultaneously or in a rollout basis. So, as you can imagine, we have hundreds of uh, different applications, and uh, those different applications, they have different authorization management currently. Some applications, they just bake in. Part of the authorization is just part of the software uh, code itself. Some other applications, they may create the bespoke uh, implementation of um, the authorization model that they use. But the difficulty is that this bespoke implementation, it's not easily translatable into other applications. So we don't have a unified uh, authorization model that can be adopted, managed, and controlled, and enhanced as the customer needs um, uh, uh, change and expand. Um, so some other applications, they may use a third-party service. And again, the same problems are um, in that domain as well. So what we, when, we, when a verified permission service was introduced, we looked at it and we thought, oh, this could be a unified solution for our, um, for our company, a unified authorization solution that we can implement and centrally, uh, centralize all the authorization logic that can be applied uh, uh, throughout the uh, applications. So as you can imagine, this could be, for example, various applications deployed in a um, various uh, AWS accounts, but we have a central Amazon verified permission service that uh, you have a policy stores that are attached to this service, and the various applications can have their own policy store and so forth. But the schema and the, uh, the authorization language and the access path are one and the same. Um, so, uh, so next, I want to give you like a two broad uh, use cases or groups or types of uh, use cases. One is the connected use case, and the other one is disconnected use case. Because when the aircraft takes off, uh, we need to keep on, uh, in mind that basically internet connectivity is either intermittent, um, you know, or non-existent or limited. So we need to uh, design our applications with that in mind, including the authorization cycle. So in order for me to explain these use cases easier, I will use our um, fictitious uh, passenger, Bob, who is trying to get to a security conference. And uh, he's about to board uh, on the aircraft. And before boarding on the aircraft, he's prompted by by his uh, airline uh, to download and install on his mobile phone a companion app. A companion app is an application that is developed by Panasonic and that gives you the ability to select your movies that you would like to watch on the flight. So this is our connected environment. We still have internet connection between, the, um, between the, his mobile phone and the, uh, the cloud. So Bob is selecting his favorite, favorite movies, 
And based on, on, on this context, we go through a number of steps to build a authorization context. We may use different uh, microservices to build authorization context. In the end, we use the authorization context uh, to make a call to Amazon verified permissions and to receive an authorization, uh, authorization decision what uh, list or sublist of movies Bob is entitled uh, to see. And we, then we use this authorization decision to filter and perform the actual fulfillment and fetch the list of movies from the database. Um, this is an example of what our context at that time is. We have information in the flight context. We know which flight Bob is flying from, where is he going. We have an airport context. We have a passenger context. And we may also have information about uh, uh, which group Bob belongs to. Maybe Bob uh, travels along with his spouse, and uh, his, he and his spouse are part of the same group. Um, so a simple, a simple um, verified permission policy could be, okay, fetch, uh, f list me in movies, allow me to list the movies that um, their release date, as you can imagine, movies, they have a release date. And you, can, you cannot show a movie before the release date. So we, we can use that to uh, filter the list of movies that are uh, available to uh, Bob and by showing only movies which uh, have a release date in the past. Um, another use case is, for example, let's say the airline would like to uh, promote their services and their in-flight system, and they uh, tell you that if you, uh, we, we will show you the movie one day, one day before the release date of the movie. So it's like a promotion for the movie. So we can create a policy that specifies that uh, please show me in movies that have a release day one day in, in, the, in the future. Um, another example is uh, Bob is a frequent flyer, uh, frequent flyer member, and we would like to, again, uh, extend this benefit to him as a frequent flyer member to be able to see movies which are not available to everybody else. So we built a policy that uh, uses this, uh, the Bob's uh, membership status in the Frequent Flyer uh, program to, um, to show him the right set of movies. And as I mentioned, we may call a number of uh, microservices in order to build this context, uh, in order to fetch, for example, to know that uh, Bob is a member of membership uh, group or not. Um, um, so this is an example of a uh, verified permission policy where, uh, let's say Bob is traveling with uh, his uh, spouse, and uh, Bob is a frequent flyer member, but the benefits of, use, of watching a premium movie is uh, he wants to extend to his spouse. So we can create a policy that will allow his spouse to uh, access the same list of movies by virtue of them being part of the same uh, membership group. So this is another example of how we can build a policy to perform this level of authorization. The second, uh, the second uh, use case broadly is the disconnected use case. And wh what's happening is Bob is, uh, has sit on, on the plane, he's uh, taking off, and um, he's presented with the opportunity. He's on the, on the air, he's flying. There's no internet connectivity from the aircraft to the ground. Um, and in front of him, he's presented with the opportunity to pair his personal electronic device with the seat bag that is installed on the aircraft itself. So Bob pairs his uh, personal electronic device, and in effect, what's, what's happening is the a seed back. Now it has the uh, it has the information about the um, the the identity of Bob. Not the identity, but the profile and who Bob is and what kind of what level of permissions are attached to uh, Bob. So when the seed back makes a call back to the streaming server and the content server to retrieve a list of movies, uh, then 
we can use policies that are, that are uh, predetermined to only filter movies that are allowed for, for Bob individually. Um, this is the, the, the use case which I want to point out is that we have a time window before, before from the time Bob selects, makes his selections, movie selections, to the time the aircraft uh, takes off. We have a window where we can sync this information. We may run hundreds or thousands of authorization requests in a connected environment, and then we can cache those uh, authorization requests and sync them with the aircraft itself. And when the aircraft takes off, we have a, basically a cache of the authorization requests that are made uh, against the uh, content database. And we can use this cache to make authorization decisions, um, actually to make a, uh, enforcement decisions on the airplane, even if we don't have a connectivity. Um, this is an example of what context we have while we are flying. The context changes. Now we don't have information about uh, uh, Bob or his itinerary or so forth, for, so forth. but we do have uh, information about the flight manifest, for example. So we can use the flight manifest. Uh, uh, we can use the a context that is provided by the aircraft itself um, the, to build uh, various uh, authorization policies that allows us to uh, control what, kind, what list of movies Bob is allowed, authorized to see. This is an interesting uh, example. Uh, I'm sure uh, all of you or many of you have ex uh, uh, experienced this. Uh, sometimes airlines will uh, ask you to fill out a credit application while you're flying. And in exchange, let's assume that in exchange for filling out a credit application, again, you get the access to a premium movies. So what we, we can do is we can again use the verified permissions to build a policy that will allow a premium movies to be displayed if the local uh, property, the local contact of Bob has changed, uh, his principal credit application property has changed to complete it. Um, so that means that we don't, uh, we can use already built-in policies to make authorizations without internet connectivity. The main point which I would like to make here is that the authorization in the enforcement events can be uh, distanced in time. They don't have to be uh, 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 in real time. We can have a authorization before enforcement we can have authorization on demand, which is the most common use case if we have a connectivity, and we can, have, we can create authorizations after the enforcement event. So Bob, uh, let's say Bob charges his credit card and we um, provide Bob with this additional service, but then when the aircraft lands, we can perform the actual authorization. We can give Bob a temporary, uh, authorization. In summary, uh, I would like to uh, say that we believe that the power of uh, CEDAR language and the power of uh, AWS Verified Permission Service infrastructure um, can give us this uh, unified authorization solution that we can use uh, in Panasonic Avionics. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Plumman. And one of the things I really like about that case study, other than the fact I now have a much deeper insight into how that movie pops up on the screen, is that it's really demonstrating the product being used to implement the business policies, the business rules around who's allowed to do what. And that was the case for a lot of our 90 customers who, who used verified permissions during gated preview. They weren't all looking at it from a purely security perspective. They were looking at how do we build policies into our application that allow the flexibility to control what users are allowed to do based on the business rules we're trying to implement. And that brings me to the personas. So the second thing I want to touch on in terms of our learnings, what you taught us as customers, is about who are the personas that care about verified permissions. And there were three that really came to the fore. 
the application developer, the access administrator, and the compliance manager. So let's run through and talk about each of those. And the one I want to drill down on is the application developer. And again, just curious, quick show of hands, won't hold you to it. How many people in the room make a living from writing applications, writing software? Yeah, decent proportion. So this is from the perspective of you. What do you get out of verified permissions? What do you care about? Or at least, what did our customers who are application developers told us they cared about? Well, three things. One, building faster. You're all working to tight deadlines to get the thing built, to get it launched. Anything that helps you move faster is greatly appreciated. Secondly, the features that you build. You're proud of the applications you build, the software you develop. You want it to have rich features that your customers and users will appreciate. And third is you got to get through the AppSec security review. This application that you're building has to pass the security review. And so you need to be able to build in the capabilities that are going to ensure that it does that. The first one I want to double click on because we had at least one customer who told us that they'd identified opportunities to accelerate application development by 20% through externalizing authorization, i.e. by having a pre-built permissions management system. In other words, in that particular case, one in five hours spent building that application pertains to the development of the permissions management system. What's the model that an application developer follows when using verified permissions? Well, we start with what we call the authorization model. The authorization model is a narrative that describes the permissions within the application. And it's typically built in conjunction with the business owner of the application. That, for example, might be the product manager. And that narrative describes in a nicely comprehensible form who's allowed to do what in this application. So we're going to use the example of a pet store, an online pet store. And so the narrative, the permissions model for that online pet store might begin along the lines of anyone can register on the site, thereby becoming a customer. Not everyone would use the word thereby, but I threw it in there. I thought it was cool. Um, customers are allowed to add pets for sale, search for pets. And so it would go on and it would describe who's allowed to do what in this application. Now, from the permissions model, we can derive the schema. The schema is a formal declaration of the entities who, who's going to be doing stuff in this application, what are the actions or things that they're going to be doing, and what are the things or resources that they're going to be doing them to. And so by defining the schema in a formal way, in this example, we've captured that we're in the namespace is pet store. One of the actions we're dealing with is search pets. It applies to a resource type called pets. So we're not defining the permissions, but we're defining the framework that these permissions are going to fit into. And that framework, that schema, enables us to then validate policies as they are created within the system. Which brings me to the third step, to create those policies. Now, one class of policies, what we refer to as application level policies, these are the policies that get created by the application developer. And they form the basic business rules of the application. So in this example, to continue with our pet store, we've created a policy that says any principal in the group customers is permitted to take the action search pets on any resource in the pets group. In other words, anyone can go onto the site who's a customer and search for pets. The application developer can also create templates, which are skeletons of policies, which then get filled out in real time when the end user is using the application and creates permissions within the application. Now what? We've built our application. We've hopefully launched it. Up it went into the wherever applications go. And now everyone's using it. Who are the other two personas we care about? Well, we care about the persona of the access administrator. This is the individual who's then responsible for managing permissions within the application on an ongoing basis after the developers moved on to a new project. What do they care about? Well, they care about are these policies, are these permissions easy to author? Can they define the necessary fine-grained permissions? 
And does the system catch mistakes when they create policies wrong? So these are the success criteria for these folk. And then the third persona that we care about is that of the compliance manager or auditor. And this individual, he or she doesn't create policies, but they care deeply, maybe deeply is too strong a word, but they care about the policies that have been created because those policies reflect the permissions or the security access within the organization and they're responsible for ensuring that, for example, this organization doesn't give open access to credit card data unless the user has got multi-factor authentication. So they're gonna to wanna to see policies that set up, that, that set those boundaries on access across the organization. All right, that was the second thing, personas. Let's talk about the third thing that you talked to us about. And that was, somewhat unsurprisingly, that no one wants to read the manual. That what you want as an organization, especially as an application developer, is give me a working application that I can use to get started that actually calls this verified permissions things so I can see how it all works, how it all fits together. Don't give me the recipe, give me the pot noodle. And so, in order to do that, we've, pre we've built a number of pre-built sample applications. And we're gonna demo one here today. This application is in a public GitHub repo. This is a link to it. I'll put the QR code up again at the end. Um, you can go here, download this application, and work through it, connect to verified permissions, and create yourself a policy store. And Abby's gonna join me on stage and help me demo it. So the application in question, you download and install it into Amplify. It uses Cognito to manage users. Now, I've talked a little bit about this. Verified permissions can be used with any identity provider. It doesn't have to be Cognito, but in this example, in this sample application, we use Cognito to manage the identities. So the first thing we're gonna to need to do is create a couple of users in Cognito who will be able to log on to the application. Okay, I'll quickly go ahead and do that. Uh, I'll go to Cognito, I have my user pool created, and I'm gonna create a user. Well, I like the pet store a lot, so I'm a customer, definitely. And then I'm gonna create one more user. Great, now because both of these are customers, I recognize these users are customers by adding them to a group called customer. <laughs> so I went to Cognito and I created this group and then I added the two users I just created to this group. Dad, and then the same thing for Mark. Fantastic, so we've created two users, Abby and Mark, and now both Abby and Mark would be able to log on to our pet store. There's a little bit of a problem, they won't be able to do anything, because we haven't actually set up the permissions that enable them to do stuff within this pet store, which is where, as you might imagine, verified permissions comes in. So the next step is we're gonna create a policy store in verified permissions. We're gonna update our application to point to this policy store so that it goes against the policy store to check who's allowed to do what. I'm gonna create our first policy in that policy store to let customers search for pets. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead, create a policy store. And the first thing most people ask me is what is a policy store? So a policy store essentially is a logical container where your policies lie. My application is going to call verified permissions to check whether access is allowed or denied. And it'll do that in a context of a specific policy store. Great, so let's try and create our first policy store. It's fairly simple, just hit create policy store. And we have three options for you. So you can either go through a guided setup, which is a wizard based setup. It'll allow you to set up your schema, create a policy and move ahead. Uh, we set up three policy stores for you to get started easily. 
But for the sake of time and it's a sample app, I'm going to create an empty one. So I hit create policy store. And then to link it to my app, I'm going to copy this policy store ID and essentially my application uses Lambda and I've stored the policy store ID as a environment variable of that Lambda. So I'm going to update it here. I'm going to hit save. Next step is praying to the gods. <laughs> uh, okay, so I come back to verified permissions and because I created an empty policy store, I don't have a single policy. So what should we do? We do the safest thing possible. We deny everything. Uh, turns out it's very safe and my app is pretty useless. <laughs> uh, so let's create a first policy that allows customers uh, to search for pets. So I hit create policy. I do want a permit policy, but rather than fill this up, I actually have a CDAR policy stored um, in one of my quip files, which I'm gonna copy over and we'll walk through this quickly. So I go to verified permissions, I remove the placeholder text, and I copy this. Let's just walk through this very quickly, I'll move forward. So policy has four things. Uh, it starts with this thing on the first line called a permit. Nothing's allowed, okay, let's permit a few things. As long as this principle, the user, is in a group called customer, so remember I added them to a group called, in a cognito group called customer, so that's what it's searching. It'll allow me to search for pets and then place orders on them. Great. I'll give it a description. Customers can, play, uh, can place order and search for pets. Okay, now I go back to my app. I log in as a customer. Let's see if this works. Okay, it did work. Um, so what you see is a decision from verified permissions, which is an allow decision. That's, that's the first thing on the authorization results query. And then it also tells you why this was allowed. So this was allowed because of a policy which ended, the ID ended in UMW. And so if I go back to verified permissions, I see this is the policy I just created. Cool. Thanks, Abby. And Abby looked very calm when he said, let's see if this will work. I guarantee he wasn't <laughs> calm at all inside. So we created a very general policy there that says anybody who's a customer can go search for pets. What if we wanted to create a more specific policy? For example, let's create a policy that enables only the customer who placed the order to go view the order. Because obviously I don't want everybody being able to see everybody's orders. That requires us to put an attribute into the policy. Okay, so let's try and do that. Uh, again, creating a policy, skipping this step because I have a policy created beforehand, which I'm just gonna copy over. Okay, great. So if you see the first four lines of this policy and the previous policy are very similar. It's a permit statement that allows anyone who's a customer to get order. The beauty is from lines five to seven, where there is this when clause. So a when clause allows you to specify attribute-based conditions. And in this case, my condition is that as long as the principal is a resource owner, access should be permitted. Let's save this. It. And then I go back to my app and say view order. So it is allowed, and the reason it's allowed is the way I've coded it uh, is basically ev it every time tries to fetch order one, and Abhi owns order one. All that's pretty much hard coded. Um, and so yeah, the decision is an allow. What it shouldn't allow is Mark, who's the other customer, to view order one, because order one is owned by Abhi. So let's try that one quickly. So log in as Mark. Great, and I'm gonna view order. And it is in fact denied. And the reason it's denied is Mark doesn't own order one. Cool, thanks. 
So we've demonstrated a basic policy and an attribute policy. Let's talk a little bit about roles. So roles, particularly in workforce applications, are very intuitive ways to set permissions. And this demo will illustrate quite nicely the, distinguish, the distinction of responsibility between the identity provider, which in this case is Cognito, which keeps track of who is assigned to which role, and the permissions management system, which in this case is Amazon Verified Permissions, which then defines what each role is allowed to do. And that division of responsibility is key, because it means I can change over time what different roles are permitted to do, or I can manage who's in what role independently of the permissions. So to do that, we're gonna use a new example or a new user called Kate, who is a pet store manager. And so we'll create Kate in Cognito first. And so I created Kate very quickly uh, in Cognito, and then I'm going to add her to a group called a store owner role. Cool, so the, the identity provider now knows of the existence of Kate and knows that Kate is in the role of store owner. Now we need to go into permissions management system and create a policy that describes what it is that store owners are allowed to do. Okay, great. Uh, let's create another policy. And just as last time, I'm gonna skip this step. And I have a copy uh, of the policy pre-created. So let's run through this policy. This policy is again simple. It just says the first line is a permit. So permit anyone who is in the store owner role to get store inventory and list orders. Okay, so I save this. Great. I go back to my React app, log in as Kate. I managed to remember six passwords. <laughs> Great, list all orders. Okay, and as you can see, it's an allow decision uh, because uh, Kate is a pet store uh, owner. Thanks, so we've, we've nailed roles, right? Um, well, not quite, because as we talked about, especially in the case of workforce scenarios, we see, or rather our customers see this, this this aspect of role explosion, why, where the number of roles in an organization expands greatly to a point where it can exceed the number of users. So why does that happen? Well, it happens for a few different reasons, but one of the reasons it happens is because roles start getting defined around specific resource sets. And so rather than just saying generally, I'm a pet store owner, people start creating roles to be, well, you're a pet store owner in Austin, and you're a pet store owner in London, and you're a pet store owner in Boise. And so all of a sudden, you've got hundreds of roles for pet store owner for the different stores that they own. So let's explore this and see how we, how we solve the problem. And let, let's take our fictitious Kate and imagine she's had a bit of a turning point in her life. She's decided that she enjoys writing software a lot more than she enjoys running a pet store. And so she's gonna start delivering her software as a service and hopefully this will generate more margin and life satisfaction than selling puppies and iguanas for her. So she's got to think about a few things. One of the things she's got to think about is how's her application going to scale? Well, fortunately, she's built it on this great elastic platform, so she's not too concerned about that. But she does have to give thought to permissions management. And as I said, her first inclination was to start creating roles for all of the different pet stores you know, a role for the pet store owner for Austin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
she realizes that's going to lead to what we might think of as role explosion. And that's going to be a nightmare to manage within the IDP because you're going to have hundreds, thousands of roles. So instead, she's like, ah, I know. I'll put an attribute onto the user profile in the IDP, which describes which store Kate, or any user for that matter, is managing. And then I'll reference that within my policy. So let's walk through that. First, let's look at that attribute in question. So I went into Kate, uh, and I'm going to edit her user attributes. I'm going to add an attribute called the employment store code. I'll tell you a secret. I was a developer before this, and I come up with really geeky names. <laughs> so I'm going to say she owns a pet store in Austin just because Julian stole the London store. OK, so I added the attribute. OK, so we have an attribute in our identity provider that keeps track of who's at what pet store. Now we can go and modify our role policy to take account of that attribute. So we can now have a still have a single role but that role is conditional on an attribute of the identity and indeed the resource. Great. So I'm going to edit the policy I created before for store owners. And I'm going to add a when clause, which again I have from before. And so this when clause essentially says that as long as the principal's employment store code, this is the cognito attribute I just uh, created and assigned to Kate, is the same as the resources store ID, everything should work. Awesome. Let's go back to my app and see how this works. And so you're going to ask me, how does this come from cognito all the way through verified permissions? And so the way that that works is, Cognito will persist it in the identity token, the JWT token, which then the app uses for authentication, and then verified permissions can see the attributes present in that JWT token, or the identity token. For that, I just need to refresh my JWT token. So I'll sign out first, and I'll sign in again. OK. So now that the JWT token contains it, this is the pet store I'm making the request for. So pet store Austin. Now let's see if she can list orders. So she can. She can list orders because she owns pet store Austin. What she shouldn't be allowed to do is view Julian's orders, which is a store in London. So let's go ahead and change that to London and say list all orders. And it should work. Because I didn't save this policy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great, I'm going to hit it again, and it's a deny decision. It proves it's a live demo rather than a you know, <laughs> <laughs> recording. <laughs> but I think it also quite nicely proves that changing the policies in real time immediately impacts the permissions within the application, as opposed to imagine having to go in and change the code or a static config file or something like that. So I, it was great that you did that on purpose, Ali. <laughs> that was totally intentional. Yeah, 100%. We practiced that a lot. All right. So thanks so much. Thank you. Brilliant job. As I said, here's, here's the QR code. You can download that and build your own pet store application and play around with verified permissions and get the hang of it. The last thing I want to touch on is, as my mother sometimes said, it's really important to fit in. <laughs> um, and the identity ecosystem out there is, is very rich and very well established. There are identity providers, there are identity governance and administration providers, orchestration providers, privileged access management, API gateways, you name it. It's well established, lots of great products out there. And so it was important for us as we launched this product to establish a partner program and to bring to work with partners to be able to explain to our customers and theirs how these products work together. And so I'm super proud and excited to be able to announce our four launch partners. CyberArk, who's a leading identity security provider that empowers developers to secure access to business critical data and infrastructure by leveraging any attribute from the cloud. 
Also, Ping Identity, whose Ping One cloud platform empowers enterprise to orchestrate secure identity experiences for authentication and authorization. Strata, an identity orchestration company that enables enterprise organizations to modernize any app, even those on premise, to use verified permissions without refactoring through their orchestration recipe driven platform, Mavericks. And Transmit Security, whose detection and risk engine provides the best in class anti fraud protection with advanced device ID behavioral biometrics. All of these partners have worked with us to create blogs, sample code, to explain to our customers and theirs how these products can be deployed together to, de to build up an end-to-end -end authentication authorization access management solution. So with that said, I'd like to hand back over to Neha, who will close us out. Hope you've enjoyed the carnival, the roller coasters, the uh, Ferris wheel, all of, uh, all of that, and flying as well. I, so how can you get started? I promise to end on how you can get started. Now, I want to go back to where we started, and I want to show you what it would mean. And we had a nice separation. This is the world that we want to get to. Show of hands. Whose world looks more like this, the messy one with intermingled code and authorization mixed? Yeah. Now, three steps to get you to the nice world. The first step is call verified permissions and discard the result. That's going to sound crazy, but hear me out. It will give you a cloud trail log of all your authorization requests and you will get an information, a comprehensive information about who is accessing what. And it already leverages your existing CloudTrail infrastructure and auditing. Great, now you're ready to move on to step two. Start writing the policies. But now, compare the authorization results that verified permissions gives you with your existing permissions. And prepare to be surprised what you discover about your application, about the users accessing it, about your permissions model. But now you have even more visibility between what you intended for the authorization to be versus what your actual system is doing. And step three, this is when you start to enforce authorization based on the results of verified permissions. So there's three steps. Start by calling verified permissions and discard the results. You can start at it today. You, no setup required. Then call verified permissions to compare the result, and then use verified permissions to enforce the result. Now, if across this whole carnival, across this whole talk, there's one simple message I'd like, like for you to take away. Stop rolling your own authorization systems. Use verified permissions to get the consistency scalability and security for your own authorization and your own applications. So here's the Pet Store app, and I want to thank you all very much for attending this uh, talk. I want to thank all my co-presenters, and we love to hear your feedback, so please complete the session survey in your mobile app. Thank you. Thank you very much.